We'll be in Ephesians 6 today. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open there. But we are about to enter the most challenging time that any of us have ever experienced. I can sense just a prophetic warning stirring in my spirit about this. I believe what's on the horizon is going to make what happened in 2020 pale in comparison to what we're about to see and experience in this life. So today I'm going to prepare you for battle. I'm not here to scare you today. That would be pointless. I'm here to push you out of oblivion. Because as the body of Christ, we're to be aware and alert to what's going on around us so that we can destroy the works of the enemy. And I admit, it's easier to go in your, to your little corner and hide, isn't it? But we're not designed for cowardice. We are designed to rule and to reign in this life. We are the body of Christ, and we must act as such. Let's start by reading most of Ephesians chapter 6 today. This is a very common block of scripture. Like if you've been in church for long, you're going to be tempted to tune out and think, I've heard this before. We're talking about the, the armor of God. I've heard this before, but I, 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 uh, I admonish you, I urge you to dig into this as if it's the first time that you've ever heard about the armor of God. So let's start Ephesians 6, chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power. Notice it didn't say, be calm in the Lord. It said to be strong in the Lord. Be an open display of his mighty power. So you have to wipe out that image that you have in your mind of unconfrontational, passive Christianity. You have to wipe that out of your mind. Because that's an antichrist doctrine that the devil uses to keep Christians out of his way. Did you all catch that? This unconfrontational, passive Christianity, the devil loves that because it keeps you out of his way. So wipe that out of your mind. Be strong in the Lord. Be an unwavering example of his mighty power, and it goes on to tell us how. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. The devil is a strategist. He's been studying and practicing on humanity since the day Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. Do you realize that? The devil attacks using strategies that he's refined over thousands of years. The only way you will be able to stand firm against the devil is to put on all of God's armor. Not some of God's armor. You have to put it all on because without it, you don't stand a chance against the devil. Let that sink in. Without all of God's armor, you don't stand a chance. So if you've been floating around, not prioritizing the word of God, living in sin, hardly praying, only coming to church when something else isn't going on, you don't stand a chance against the strategies of the devil. He's going to get you every time. Yes, the devil is a defeated foe. He doesn't stand a chance against the power of Jesus Christ. But the only way we operate in that power is if we put on all of God's power. And it goes on to tell us what we're up against. It says, For we do not fight against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You see, most people think that other people are the enemy. Your spouse, maybe. Your ex. I mean, and since you're here at a church that ain't woke, I assume that you recognize the error of the left the Biden administration, LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, like that whole, all that stuff. You recognize the error, right? But the people are not the enemy. They're not the enemy. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. The fight is against unseen spirits, unseen evil spirits that are orchestrating all of this ungodliness. The devil has a strategy, and it's a good one. And he has plenty of evil spirits to help him carry it out. But it can only be done through people. So what we see going on are evil spirits controlling and manipulating people. That's why you think it's the people, because that's what you see with your eyes, is the people. But you must remember this scripture, it's not the people. It's not the people, it's the evil spirits that are controlling and manipulating people. And guess what? They're not just manipulating unbelievers. They're manipulating everybody who does not have on the armor of God. Hmm. Let that sink in, right? 
If you don't take this seriously, there's a good chance that you will be advancing the kingdom of darkness, even though your intention is to advance the kingdom of God. Again, I'm not here to scare you today. I'm here to push you out of oblivion. I'm making sure you're alert to what's really going on so that you can stand firm against the strategies of the devil. So as we continue reading, I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul reiterates what he already told us just a few verses ago. That means it's important, right? Did you all hear it? He says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Again, we have to put on every piece of the armor. Every piece. Why? So we can resist the enemy. We're in a, we're in a battle. There's a fight going on. And it's only going to intensify. And I don't know if it's going to be weeks or months, but soon we're going to face the greatest battle that we've ever been up against. Are you ready? Do you have the armor on? Because if we put on every piece of God's armor, guess what? After that battle's over, we'll be standing. And not just standing, but standing firm. What happens if you don't put on every piece of God's armor? Let's not find out, right? Let's not find out. I pray this message motivates you to stop messing around and take the word of God seriously. In case you're wondering what it means to put on the armor of God, Ephesians goes on to give us exact detail. It says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Before I go on, I want to ask, is there anybody else who's sensing that we're about to come up against the greatest battle we've ever faced? I just want to see if there's a consensus in there. You feel it coming. So let's break these down to make sure we all understand. Since we don't wear armor the same way they did back then, it's helpful to know exactly what the Apostle Paul was referring to. So the belt of truth. The King James Version of the Bible actually gives us more detail. It says this, have your loins girt about with truth. The only loin I know of is a pork loin. And if you cook it right, it's really good. Who can cook a mean pork loin? Anybody in the room? Feel, feel free to bring that over anytime. But since that's not what we're talking about here, I researched the original language and found out that the loins is a place on your body where generative power resides. We've sanitized this over the years to where most translations say the belt around your waist or the belt around your hips. But what we're really talking about is the family jewels. Right? The reproductive part of your body. That's what it's talking about. Now take a look at this picture and it's all going to make sense. The main reason soldiers wore a belt is to protect their ability to reproduce. You all see those three strands hanging down in front of the family jewels. That's what the purpose of the belt was. To protect their ability to reproduce. God's truth, the Bible, is what protects our ability to reproduce. You hear it? We cannot multiply the kingdom of God without an unwavering dedication to God's truth. Yet we have churches everywhere getting as close to possible as sin without sinning, as they would say, thinking that that's how you get people saved. They bend the truth, they stay silent about the truth, and they pat themselves on the back for the large following that they have produced. Look at what we've done. Yet all they're doing is giving people what their itching ears want to hear. Sound familiar? Don't be fooled by the size of their following or their false humility because these people also say, well, we're just not religious. We love people. It's a bunch of false humility. They are not multiplying the kingdom of God. They are multiplying the kingdom of darkness. And get this, I don't think they even realize it. I think their intentions are pure. Like they really do want to multiply the kingdom of God. They just don't even realize what they're doing. Maybe some of them do. I don't know. But I choose to believe the best. Life is better that way. But that's what happens when you don't put on the belt of truth. Without, without an unwavering dedication to God's truth, not only are you going to end up in hell, you're going to take people with you. You're going to convince them to go with you. So now let's talk about the body armor of God's righteousness. The King James Version calls this the breastplate of righteousness. So this is the armor that protects your most vital organs, your heart, your lungs, and all those other organs essential to life. So imagine a bulletproof vest. I mean, that's what we're talking about. It protects the most easy thing of you to penetrate, and it protects you from the front and the back. So putting on God's righteousness is what protects your spirit. 
is what keeps you spiritually alive. So righteousness, that's kind of like a churchy word, isn't it? So let me explain it to you real quick. All it means is living right by God's standards. That's righteousness. And since the Bible says not to gossip, you don't gossip, right? That's living by God's standards. Since it says to only think on good things, you only think on good things. When that bad thought comes up, you take it captive and kick it out. That doesn't belong in here. The list goes on. But here's the best part. You have been given God's righteousness as a gift. It's not something you have to muster up on your own. It's been given to you as a gift. All you have to do is take it like a big coat and put it on. Put on God's righteousness. Now you see why there's an all-out attack on righteous living. The devil wants to normalize all kinds of sin because when you take off your righteousness, it makes it easy for him to kill you spiritually. There is no once saved, always saved. I don't know why I have to keep coming back to this, but I do. There is no once saved, always saved. Once you give your life to Christ, you better put on your righteousness because he has a strategy to take you out. And you make it easy on him if you don't put on that righteousness. Put it on. But even the best of his evil strategies is guaranteed to fail if you put on the armor of God. The devil don't stand a chance against you when you have on the armor of God. Next up are the shoes of peace. And the King James Version says to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These shoes are made for walking. That's just what they do. And it was no different for the soldiers back then. They, shoes enabled them to go long distances without tearing up their feet. They had big journeys ahead of them, right? And as part of God's armor, we're to always be prepared to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, to everyone. We must be eager to tell the story of how Jesus saved us and how he wants to do the same thing for them. And it's not a mistake that the scripture calls this the gospel of peace. It's not like he gave us that extra word, just like, here's a bonus. The gospel of peace, the only way to find true peace is by following Jesus Christ. So when you're telling people about Jesus, you better make sure they know that the only way to peace is through Jesus Christ. So with our shoes of peace on, we are to go the distance and take the gospel of peace everywhere the Holy Spirit leads us. Next up is the shield of faith, which enables us to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Take a look at what the King James says. Above all, take up the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all, all the fiery darts of the wicked. How many darts? All of them. Sweet. With faith, you can stop everything, every single thing the devil throws at you. Did you know that? With faith, you can stop every single thing the devil throws at you. Even that incurable disease, you can stop with faith. A flaming arrow hurtling at you is quite intimidating, isn't it? Have you all ever experienced one of the devil's flaming arrows coming at you? It's intimidating, unless you have a shield. When you have a shield, you just put it up, stops the arrow, the arrow falls to the ground, the flame goes out. Yay. (laughs) So what is faith? It's kind of a complex word, or maybe we've made it complex when it really isn't. But here's what I found to be the best way to explain it. Faith is confidence in God's word. It's when you get to the point that you notice a symptom in your body and your first thought is, ha, trespasser, get on out of here. You don't belong here. And it doesn't matter how long it takes for that symptom to leave because you know God's word promises healing for your body. It's when the enemy whispers, you're a failure. There's no hope for you. And you respond, ha, ha. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You just wait. God promised me I'm going to come out on top of this. Faith is confidence in God's word. No matter what lie the devil throws at you, faith stops it every time. And how does faith come? By hearing the word of God. Guess what? Your faith is coming. You're getting faith today. Isn't that awesome? When you respond to the word of God, When you speak the word of God, you're lifting up that shield of faith and quenching the fiery dart. All right, two more to go. Helmet of salvation. We still use this armor today, so we we get what it means to protect our head from dangerous blows. We wear them in football. Do you wear them in rugby too? I assume, because that's a pretty fierce sport. You wear them on a motorcycle, or at least you should. When it comes to the helmet of salvation, though, we're talking about protecting your mind, your thoughts. Anybody need some help protecting their thoughts? When you constantly think about your salvation, 
mainly the completion of your salvation. We're talking about when you get to heaven. It aligns your thought life with the will of God when you're thinking about your salvation, when you're thinking about heaven. If you are heaven-minded, you got your mind set on heaven, the enemy can't pull you away from the things of God because you're not going to let anything come between you and your eternity in heaven. If you're heaven-minded, you don't fear a thing. If I die, I'm going to heaven. If you kill me, I'm going to heaven. If you take everything away from me, I'm going to heaven where I have everything. I'm going to heaven. So put on your helmet of salvation. Spend time thinking about your eternity in heaven. Spend time thinking about what Jesus provided for you because it will protect your thoughts. If you're having a battle in your mind, think about your salvation. Simple, huh? Last but not least is our weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Everything else we talked about protects us from attacks to the enemies. Now it's time to turn the table and attack the devil. We have one weapon that's effective against the devil. We don't need anything else but this one thing because it defeats him every time. So what is it? Wow, y'all are good. It's like you've read the Bible before. That's good stuff. It says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He wanted to make sure you got that one, right? (laughs) Our weapon is the word of God, and we're not talking about hitting the devil with our physical Bible, right? We're not talking about leaving the Bible sitting on the coffee table. When you look up the Greek word that was translated to word in word of God in this scripture, you find out that it's rhema. Anybody know what rhema means? It's the Bible school that I graduated from. It's that church in Broken Arrow that has a million Christmas lights. I wonder why they named it that. Because rhema means the spoken word of God. How did Jesus defeat the devil in the wilderness? By speaking the word of God. How do we defeat the enemy? By speaking the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the spoken word of God. You can't just read it. You have to speak it. And you must speak it with authority. It has to be backed by confidence in God's word. If you don't have confidence in what you're saying, it's not going to work. You have to speak it, but it has to be backed by faith. The next verse gives us even more clarity. It says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know what this tells me? We don't pray enough. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. I mean, that's a clear and simple instruction. So clear, so simple. Yet most Christians don't even pray daily. And if we do, it's, it's not all the time, but at our scheduled prayer times. And a big part of this is because we don't fully understand what prayer is. The King James Version actually breaks it out into two words, which I think is great. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So prayer and supplication. Why do we have to use two words? Well, when you dive into the meaning of these two words, you find out that prayer means when you go to a certain place, set aside for prayer, and you pray. In other words, it's what we do every Sunday. It's what you do in your morning quiet time, or your evening quiet time, or whatever. When you set aside a time, when you set aside a place, and you go pray. Supplication, on the other hand, refers to constantly seeking God, constantly asking God, constantly pleading with God. So as you go through your day, you're asking God, guide me in this. How do I make this decision? When a need arises for you or someone else, you stop right then and you pray and you plead with God to meet that need. That's supplication. We need prayer and we need supplication. We should have these scheduled formal prayers. We should gather on Sundays and pray. We should schedule prayer time in our lives. But not only that, but we should seek God throughout our day, constantly asking him for direction, pleading with him for the needs around us. And let's not pass over the fact that the instructions said to pray in the Spirit. This refers to praying in the Holy Spirit. Yes, pray with English. Pray pray with words that you understand. But also pray using that prayer language that you received from the Holy Spirit. So many people receive their prayer language and then never use it. Use it every day. 
If you don't have your prayer language, ask him for it. He's eager for you to have it. He's not withholding it from you. He's waiting on you to overcome your doubts and your hesitations. That's all. And as soon as you do, you'll get it. He's patient with you. We keep asking. You'll get it. But here's the main point of my message today. Pray more. Pray more. Maybe I should have just got up here and said that. That would have been a real short sermon, right? Pray more. You're not praying enough. You need to pray more. I need to pray more. We need to pray more. A few days ago, I received a text from Susie that was clearly led by the Holy Spirit. Susie, wave your hands so everybody knows who you are. It's amazing. She ran across a scripture in the Old Testament and felt compared to share it with me. Take a look at this. This is amazing. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. It hit me like a bag of rocks. Anybody ever get a scripture like that? Just, wow. Lack of prayer is a sin. I'm a quiet guy. I don't say a lot because I'd rather listen and learn. I'm a man of few words. These are the most words I say all week whenever I get up here. Beth will say amen to that. She wishes I would talk more. Even my sermons are shorter than most, which I'm sure many of you appreciate. This has been great for learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit, because in my quiet time with the Lord, I don't feel the need to talk the whole time. That's another thing to overcome, right? So you can learn to listen. But a few weeks ago, I was reading about how the only way God can establish his will on the earth is if we speak it. His, his will has been established in heaven, but he's given us dominion over the earth. And if we want his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have to speak it. We have to speak it. Because without our words, his hands are tied. Because he's given us dominion and he does not go back on his word. So when we look around and we're getting frustrated that things don't align with God's will of healing and peace and abundance, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Don't blame God. Don't fuss at God. Look in the mirror. Have you been speaking God's word? Have you been proclaiming it over your life? God is looking for people who will speak and declare God's word over ungodly situations. Who's going to do it? He needs us to boldly proclaim his will, even though most people are going to think you're nuts when you start speaking this stuff. They're going to look at you like you're crazy, and that's probably why we stay silent more often than we should. Tim, you act like you know. You have firsthand experience? Yeah, a lot of people think you're crazy. That's not a bad thing. The reason our lives don't look more like heaven is because we don't pray enough. We don't speak the word of God enough. We're being lazy and haphazard with our mouths. We're speaking all kinds of other junk. We're gossiping and saying things about other people and fussing about how cold it is in here, how hot it is in here. I mean, we say all kinds of empty words. We talk and we talk and we talk, but we're not proclaiming God's word. Use your mouth, but say God's words instead of all those other things, instead of your words. If you're not praying at all times and on every occasion, it's time to repent. I can tell you that's what I was doing a few days ago. Susie, thank you for leading me to repentance. I was sinning against the Lord with my lack of prayer. I was praying, but not at all times and on every occasion. And you know, when sin is revealed in our lives, what do we do? Cry and roll on the floor and (laughs) tell God how sorry we are. No, he's looking for you to repent. He's looking for you to turn away from your wicked ways and do it God's way. So I want to ask, just by a raise of hands, is there anybody in here who needs to repent for a lack of prayer today? (laughs) Oh, yeah. We're headed into the fight of our lives.
And it's going to be joyful, I guess, for us. I know it will be when you got on the armor of God. That's what that was about. We're going to be dancing through the fight. There's a prophetic warning stirring in my spirit. It's not a conspiracy. It's just the strategy of the devil unfolding before our eyes. But you don't have to be afraid if you have the armor on. Actually, you won't be afraid if you have the armor on. You'll be dancing to that music she was playing for us while the world's up in flames, right? I'm all right. God's got me. God's got us. If you are fearful about what's to come, consider this your warning today. Put your armor on. Would you put it on? All of it. Don't skip any piece of it. Put it all on. But don't just put your armor on. Would you pick up your weapon? And would you fight? For the sake of those around us, we have to open our mouths and we have to speak. We have to speak. We have to speak the word of God with boldness and use it like a dang sword. And the most urgent instruction for today is to pray. Pray. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. That was good, wasn't it? Go ahead and smash that like button to help us get God's word out to everyone who needs it. And another way that you can help is by partnering with us financially. Your generous giving is what enables us to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Visit nolimits.fyi to give securely online. And hey, don't forget to subscribe before you go. Now let's go make a difference.